With the overburden gone to the dikes, the oil sands are exposed. The Great Canadian Oil Sand Company has two massive self-propelled bucket wheels that scoop the black sand to a conveyor system. The bucket wheel itself is 33 feet in diameter and the machine stands about 10 stories high. It's electrically powered and weighs 1,800 tons, about the same as a couple of dozen jumbo jets. The teeth of the buckets are about 120 per bucket, each one weighing 100 pounds. Each of the two excavators moves an average of four to 5,000 tons of tar sand per hour and is operated by only one man. It takes about two tons of sand to yield one barrel of bitumen. The conveyors have a speed of about 12 miles per hour and the main belt is six feet wide and almost a mile long. Keeping the machinery in operation is something of a problem. In the heat of summer, at perhaps 85 degrees Fahrenheit, the sticky tar sand gums things up. And in the winter, it freezes as hard as rock. When the excavation was first attempted, in the winter, the teeth of the buckets glowed red and tore off within four hours. The conveyors drop the oil sand into a storage bin at the extraction plant, but only for an hour until it begins the first stage of the steam and hot water and caustic soda separation. The fine sand which settles out in the hot water is pumped to the tailings pond. And the bitumen at this point still contains sulfur and nitrogen and some heavy metals. It's thick and viscous and not immediately usable. Heating of this heavy bitumen during refining leaves coke, a carbon-rich product. The light hydrocarbons driven off during coking are what is recovered by condensation. This crude oil is much lighter and it can be further refined for any number of uses. At this stage, the sulfur in the original bitumen is driven off. And the final refined product is much more like the gasoline that we know. One of the main byproducts is of the sulfur. It's currently being produced at about 350 tons per day. There's no market for this quantity, and the accumulating pile is something of a problem. It's a problem shared by mines, too. Sulfide ore also produces sulfur in vast quantities. The other major byproduct is coke. Uh, most of this is used in the refining process as a fuel. Over 2,000 tons of the 3,000 that are produced per day are in fact used on the site. But this results in yet another problem, since the coke is also high in sulfur. And when burned, it releases sulfur dioxide. Like many other refining processes, there's still room for technological improvement. The other waste problem is the liquid waste, the tailings. They're pumped from the extraction plant to tailings ponds at about 24,000 gallons per minute. Being so close to a major river, adequate dike construction is critical in order to hold this water, which is by far from pure, as well as revegetation of the mined out area and the tailings. The Protection of the watershed is one of the major concerns of the tar sand operators. And when the operation gets bigger in the future, it'll become an even greater concern. The $2 billion Syncrude operation on lease 17 will eventually extend over 12 square miles, covered on average by five feet of muskeg and 80 feet of barren overburden. Beneath that, the tar sand averages about 150 feet. Once again, the mining method is open pit, 
but instead of bucket wheels, Syncrude will use four 80 cubic yard capacity drag lines, about five times the capacity of this experimental drag line. Plans call for the plant to be in operation by 1978. And then it should eventually produce 125,000 barrels of crude per day. And that rate should continue for 25 years. Syncrude's test pit is quite interesting and shows a number of geological features of the tar sand. At the lip of the pit, as always, are the brown glacial gravels. And beneath them, Cretaceous shale. The upper part of the tar sand itself is also regarded as an economic overburden, since this higher part usually contains less than 8% of bitumen, which is a minimum level for economic recovery. The richest beds are always found towards the base of the tar sand, where bitumen may be as high as 18%. The grain size differs at various places in the sand, and this is what marks the bedding in the sand. The sand, in fact, is much coarser towards the base until the grain size reaches pea-sized pebbles. The black bitumen should not be confused with oil. Although it is a hydrocarbon and a liquid hydrocarbon like oil, it's structurally different, so that it has to be altered during refining or cracked in oil man's jargon. What essentially happens is that hydrogen is added. The sands are not well consolidated, despite the steep pit sides which can be cut in it. There's quite a lot of water as well as bitumen between the grains. In fact, each grain is coated with a film of water and that in turn by a film of bitumen. This is what makes the tar sand so hard in winter. Cross bedding and channeling in the sands is conspicuous and evidence of the waterborne origin of the deposit. In this case, the water flowed from right to left. Another unconventional source of oil is so-called oil shale. The most extensive high-grade deposits in North America, and probably in the world, cover about 16,000 square miles at the border between Utah, Colorado, and Wyoming. 